Hi, everyone, and welcome to our program today. My name is Shane Holsgrove, and uh, today I want to share something with you that I believe can really help you um, in terms of like just your, your walk with the Lord um, and your walk in this life as a believer. Um, so, you know, um, it, it's going to address many things. I think most of all, it'll address the idea of temptation. Um, and so we're going to speak a bit about that. And, you know, I, I, I think um, uh, what we're going to be looking at this is where is the strength of temptation and how do we um, resist it? How do we deal with this? Okay. Um, I might not answer all the questions that could come up with this, but I trust it will be a blessing to you. So the reason why I um, am feeling just to get into this is because, I, I, you know, in, in pastoring and dealing with so many people, one of the things that has come up again and again and again is this thing of, you know, um, this is just the way I am, you know. Um, and you'd have to fill in the blanks as to what does that mean, uh, or, uh, or should I say the context of that. But a lot of people are like, um, you know, I have feelings for this individual, you know, and I've fallen in love with this individual, whether they're a man, a woman, or whether they're uh, an animal, you know, it, 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 like meaning it, it, it doesn't matter about, um, uh, for a lot of people, um, whether it's LGBTQ, uh, 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 or whether it's just a normal relationship in terms of heterosexual, um, or whether it's just, you know, like um, uh, giving into some sin and you just kind of like say that this sin, there's nothing wrong with it because I feel right when I'm doing that. Um, uh, this kind of fits into all of that, okay? But, you know, um, another area before I get going that this also addresses is the idea of emotions regarding um, depression. Now, let me just start off and say that I know that a lot of depression and um, psychological issues are issues which need medical attention. So what I'm sharing with you today isn't um, um, an encouragement to forsake the medical field. It's not an encouragement to stop taking medication. And it's not an um, endorsement against those things against medical doctors and all of that. Some people need to take medication to correct a physical imbalance. Um, but I believe that what I'm going to share is part of the solution. It, it, and and um, for some people, this is the only solution, but like in terms of medical things and whatever, like this is something that I believe can help. So in James chapter one, okay, let's look at this. Um, <clears throat> James chapter one, verse 12. Uh, starts off and says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. Okay, now for us to just pause there and say, um, <clears throat> if we're enduring temptation, um, it means we're standing under. That's what endure means, to stand under. So it's, we're standing under the pressure of doing something we shouldn't do. Okay, so we're tempted to... Um, still, but we're standing under that pressure. Now, this is maybe not a strong example, but you're standing under that pressure and you're not giving into it. Okay? Or you're standing under the pressure of <coughs> um, having sex before marriage. And, you know, uh, but you're, you're standing strong on the, the belief that um, this isn't the right thing. I'm not going to do it. I'm resisting. And so you're enduring. You're, you're pushing through it. Th those, those, um, uh, feelings of forces to pull you off track. Enduring temptation would be, I really just want to do this, but this is wrong. I'm going to endure. I'm going to push through and I'm going to do the right thing. Okay, so the Bible here says you're blessed when you endure temptation. When you stand under that temptation and you don't give up to that temptation, you're blessed. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which uh, the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, there's a lot of things that we can pull out of that context-wise. Um, but what I want to pull out from there is that God is not the one tempting us. God is not the one tempting us. Because a lot of people might read that and think, okay, God's tempting or testing me. Look at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God's not the one tempting you. 
Okay. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Okay, so verse 14 and 15 are the keys there. I want to read it to you from, let's say, the New Living Translation. 14, it says, James chapter 1, Temptation comes from our own desires. What is a desire? It's talking about a feeling. So where do, does temptation come from? It comes from your own desires, your own feelings. It comes from, your, um, from within you. Okay, temptation comes from our own desires, um, which entice us and drag us away. So we are all tempted. Temptation is relative to the individual. I might be tempted with things that you're not tempted with, and you might be tempted with things that I'm not tempted with. A lot of people experience the same kind of temptations because we're all within the same culture. We all succumb to the same influences, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, we've got social media <clears throat> telling us that we should do this and we should look like this and, and whatever. We've got our social media pushing down a picture of what we should be like and what life should be like. Um, and, and so those impressions are uh, put upon us and now maybe we feel like we should be a certain way. Um, and, and, and that's a, um, or now temptation comes from that to be a certain way. Let me put it like that rather. Um, you know, you could, let me, let me, so let me say it like that. Temptation comes from the desires that we have within us. The desires that we have within us come from what we're exposed to. Someone in the Amazon rainforest who's living in a tribe and wearing a little, um, uh, loincloth will not be tempted with uh, overindulging in chocolate cake because they don't know what chocolate cake is. Maybe they've never seen a chocolate cake, and so chocolate cake is not a desire for them. But you and I may have seen and experienced, tasted and seen an amazing chocolate cake before. And so then we're tempted with a good chocolate cake. Yeah, I, I am. Um, there's a, a German Christmas cake that I really enjoy. It's called the Stollen. Okay. And uh, a friend of mine, he, um, uh, he is German and uh, he grew up uh, uh, eating, um, I think, a, one of his great aunts or something like that, a, a, Chris, a, a Christmas Stollen that she would make. And he says it was horrible. So he doesn't like Stollen. And um, I know that you get some horrible Stollen and you get some good Stollen. So when I brought home from Europe an amazing Christmas stolen, it's, an, it's delicious. Um, and I didn't, it, it didn't tempt him at all because he's like, I don't like that. I, he had a bad experience with that. <laughs> so he's not tempted with that. Many of you watching don't know what a stolen is. You've never heard of it. You've never seen it. You've never tasted it. You've never been tempted with it. Point being, you can't be tempted with something you've never been exposed to. Isn't th th that is like such a revolutionary um, truth. You cannot be tempted with what you have never thought about. I have never uh, been tempted to shoot someone in the back of a head. Now I've got the idea, uh, obviously because of movies, right? But I've never held a gun. I've never been exposed to that. Uh, that's maybe a weak example. But, you know, there are, are some people who've never been exposed to, um, I heard this, this testimony of this, this guy. He said he never imagined that um, homosexuality was, he didn't know it was a thing. He never knew it was possible until he was in his early 20s. Because he, where he grew up, it was never, like, it was never mentioned. Like, he didn't know it existed. He, he was never exposed to it. He never thought of it. Okay. Um, now there are like in, in, in nature and in, in human nature, there are natural urges towards um, you know, se sexual interactions and things like that too. But you can't be tempted to take that somewhere like um, uh, uh, where a lot of people are taking that. 
You know, some people just feel um, uncomfortable within themselves for different reasons, because of ridicule, because of uh, teasing, because maybe you know, they, they've got an awkward uh, uh, body in terms of their development or whatever, I don't know. Um, but like they, they just don't feel the same as maybe you feel or I feel um, or someone else feels. And so because they feel different, society will come and tempt them that, you know what, you may be a man trapped in a woman's body or something like that. Like there's a lot of people who don't even imagine that that's possible until someone tells them it's possible. You know, we, nobody could have maybe, um, uh, uh, um, let, me, let me pause there and say this. The bottom line is you cannot be tempted with what you don't think. If you think of something, then you can be tempted with it. Good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> okay? Um, but, you know, so if we're wanting to deal with temptation, we need to deal with the desire, the, the, the what's inside, not what's outside. So if someone's an alcoholic and they are needing to stop being an alcoholic, drinking too much, um, then yes, the environment needs to change in order to help that person change. But you know, legalism is always looking at the outside. Legalism is always saying, you know what, you need to stop this and you need to change that and you need to clean up your act. That's unhelpful. That's unhelpful. You know, we can very easily become what Jesus, um, what's the word? Jesus rebuked. What did he rebuke? He called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. <laughs> you know what that means? He said, he said, you're whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. So he said, you're full of corruption, one translation says. He says, you're full of death. You're not full of any life. But on the outside, you've painted it and you've made it look pretty. But on the inside, it's not pretty. We must be careful that we don't fall into the trap of on the inside having all of these, these, these this um, uh, disaster, this, this, this unprettiness is the word I want to say, but I know it's not a word. We, mustn't, we must be careful not to portray something that's not tr true on the inside. So, you know, yes, if you've got a problem and that problem is damaging towards you, that problem is, is um, uh, uh, um, uh, hurtful towards you or other people, stop it, okay? Uh, uh, if, if alcohol's a problem, don't go to a pub. If alcohol's a problem, don't walk through a liquor, uh, go to a liquor store, an alcohol shop. Um, if um, alcohol's a problem, don't hang out where people are drinking. Change your environment. But you know what? Changing your environment cannot change your desires. It can just help you not go there. That's that, that, that will help a lot of people. You know, you've been trying maybe to change your behavior by changing your environment. You've got certain triggers in certain areas of your life. And so, you know, if I go to, if I hang out with that person, yeah, th th this is maybe the best example of all. We, sometimes we feel like if I'm around that person, they trigger me and I get angry and then I start shouting. So I mustn't be around that person. Can I tell you what the Bible is telling us from James chapter one about that situation? It's saying that that person is not the problem you are. Yes, that person might be doing things that trigger you, but the, the trigger is not the problem. What's inside the gun is the problem. <laughs> okay, the fact that there is a trigger is a problem. So, I mean, let me read it again. It says here, um, temptation comes from our own desires. So the temptation to get angry in a situation comes from something that's in you. And you know what's not in you in that situation is love. When someone comes and just rubs you up the wrong way and just is, 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 is triggering you and, and you now just want to pop with anger and explode all over the place and whatever, you know, that, the, 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 the problem isn't the person. The problem isn't what they say. The problem is how, uh, what, what's inside of you and is causing you to receive that in the way you're receiving that and process that in the way that you're processing it. And in those type of situations, we're being more self-centered than we are being focused on the other person. Yeah, the, the, the saying is true. A hurting person is a hurting person. What do we mean by that? Someone who's hurting you is probably hurting on the inside. So you might be in the, uh, in a, in the workplace uh, or at school <clears throat> or even at home and someone is just bullying you. 
They're just bully. They're just a bully. They're calling you names. They're um, I don't even know what, but they're just doing certain things to to make your life a problem. They're probably having problems in their life, and they are now pouring it onto you. That's why they're 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 doing those things. Now, if your heart is is not in the right place, and and if you have um, uh, uh, aren't operating in love towards other people, that'll that could trigger you, and you could just um, give in to the temptation to hit them, give in to the temptation to shout the, at them or put them in their place or whatever. But if you're operating in love, you know what's going to happen? You're going to think, I wonder why this person is acting the way that they are. And you know what? In some situations, they might be acting the way that they are, and you might not be helping the situation because of the way that you are. And in those situations, I trust the Lord would give you wisdom on how you can change to be a blessing to other people more. Because we can't just say, this is the way that I am, just accept me. That's not how life works. I know that the, there's a, a minority in the world today that are like, this is the way that I am, just accept me the way that I am. No, we mustn't be like that. Like, yes, there's love, but if you, your lifestyle and your choices and your values aren't, uh, are, are harmful towards other people, then it, that shouldn't be allowed. So you, we, you shouldn't be allowed to just express your anger because you're angry. You should deal with your anger. And the anger is rooted in something that's inside and something that's also not inside, and that's love. Because if we're operating in love, we're not going to respond in anger, the temptation to give in to anger. It wor this, this works with, with anything. You know, we need to get to the root of it and see what is the root of this temptation. Why am I feeling this? We can change the environment, not hang around that person so that we're not triggered to respond to them like that. And that can help. But if we want help long term, we need to go deeper. And we need to allow the love of God to affect the area in our hearts that it needs to affect so that we can be a blessing and so that we aren't triggered by what people say. You know, I'm not perfect. And I know that in some situations, maybe, you know, um, I might give in to people uh, in a sense of not respond properly to them all the time. But I do know that I, I, I largely respond to people properly. And, you know, if, if, if someone's kind of saying things that I disagree with or that I don't like or that are even very offensive, do you know that I'm not offended? Very seldom am I offended when someone says something offensive. Why? Because, like, firstly, uh, 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 there isn't, in me, I'm thinking about the other person. Why are they saying this? Secondly, I don't value their opinion enough to get offended at them because I don't think that their opinion about me matters. But then lastly, it's like, you know, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, um, <clears throat> and this is the key to victory. This is the key to freedom for so many people. So listen up, Galatians 2.20, I'm going to read it, um, but it starts off, I'm going to open it just in case I'm uh, misquoting it, but I know I'm not, but it starts off and it says, I am crucified with Christ, I'm dead, and then it says, nevertheless I live, I'm alive, you can see that, but not I, Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what this is saying is I'm dead, I'm crucified as Christ, but Christ is living in me. And Christ is living through me. Think about that for a moment, okay? The living part of me is Christ. I am dead. Now, I like, um, um, this, is, this is good. If, if you look at what it's saying when it says I am crucified, the I am crucified is actually ego. In the, in the Greek. So it, it's, <coughs> excuse me, what it's saying is that we need to realize and recognize that we, we shouldn't have an ego as a Christian. In Christ, there should be no I. In Christ, there is you know, a community, there's us, but it's Christ in me that lives through me. And so there's no longer any place for self-centeredness. There's no longer any place for selfishness. If you think about it, what we're saying here is, number one, that all sin is emotional. Any sin is being emotional. 
giving in to any temptation, whether it's a, a lust of uh, sex, whether it's a, a lust of um, wanting to indulge in emotions of certain kind, like anger, whether it's a, uh, a wanting to hit someone, um, steal, I don't know. Any, lust is emo uh, any sin is emotional. Now, I'm not saying emotions are sin, because God gave us emotions. There's, he's a God of emotion. But every sin is rooted in emotion. And if we can realize that, we can overcome temptation. Because now I need to deal with what's inside of me, yes, but emotion. But one of the big things that we see here from Galatians chapter 20 is that I am dead. A dead person doesn't have emotion. Now, we do have emotion as believers. I'm not saying we don't. But think about it in terms of a corpse. Okay? A corpse doesn't respond. You know, you can lift up a corpse's hand and it doesn't drop as slowly as that. I, I dropped it. You can go, it does that, you know. So you can, um, you, you can um, respond like, uh, let me put it like this. You can insult a corpse. You can um, spit on a corpse. You can call a corpse name, a dead person, name. They're not going to respond, you know. Um, but that's how we should be. We should see that I'm dead in Christ. So if someone in, uh, insults me, I don't respond negatively because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So I need to rather than, I would want to hit that person and respond like this. I mustn't respond like that. I must rather say, okay, how would Christ respond to this person? That he would respond in love. So I'm going to respond in love. How would Christ, like, okay, I'm tempted to um, do something, whatever the sin is that you're thinking of now. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm dead to this. In the natural, I would want to do this. But how would Christ respond to this? Okay. He, he, he wouldn't maybe in some cases because he wouldn't be tempted with that specific thing. But the point is, is like we need to, uh, realize that we, we can respond like Christ would because Christ lives in us and Christ lives through us. That's, a, that's an important. Go over to an uh, important point, Galatians chapter 5. We see this talking about now how to walk in the Spirit because that's what we're talking about with regard to this. Um, so Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So often with temptation or something that you're struggling with, we, we kind of feel like it's this uncontrollable force. Now, yeah, um, this goes off into two, so many different directions that I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Um, but, you know, if we look at Gale uh, Romans chapter 6, it says, I'm dead to sin. So if we consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to righteousness, um, then we will realize that we are free from that thing that seeks to enslave us. But this is giving us the answer of how to walk in freedom. This I say, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do you not fulfill the lust of the flesh? By walking in the Spirit. So we need to find out what is walking in the Spirit. A lot of believers, Christians, um, um, believe that they should deal with sin in order to be more holy. They need that, that's what they believe, wrongly believe. They need to deal with sin so that they can be more holy. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the body of Christ once and for all. What that says is that we are sanctified, made holy through the body of Christ once and for all. That says Jesus was the payment for our sin. He paid for our sin so that we could be holy. We cannot deal with our sin to become anything. He dealt with our sin so we could become holy. So now we need to believe in what he's done for us so that we can be holy. So at salvation, I believe in the gospel that he died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead to make me right with God. 
And when I believe that, I become right with God. I become a, a new creation. I become holy because of His sacrifice, not the things I sacrifice. And so I don't deal with sin to become holy. I believe to become holy. He dealt with sin so I could be holy. And when I realize that, it frees me from the false sense of, of obligation to try and deal with my sin in order to be accepted by God or in order to be uh, holy. Because what's, what's going to help you walk in freedom is realizing that you are free from sin, realizing that you are holy. We shouldn't be focused in on sin. We shouldn't be focused in on the problem. We should be focused in on our Savior and focused in on the solution. Focused in on what has the gospel made us. A lot of people in trying to deal with temptation are praying against temptation. Praying about temptation. Praying about the sin. Praying that God would take away this, this, this um, temptation from them. God cannot take you out of that temptation. Because the temptation came from within you. You can take yourself out of temptation. By dealing with what's inside of you. By changing your thinking, by changing your focus, by walking in the Spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh? Well, it's talking about walking according to your new nature. Walking according to spiritual truth. Walking according to who you are now as a believer. Not walking according to the natural. In the natural, if you insult me, I might want to hit, hit you up the right way. <laughs> I might want to, you know, insult you back. But in the Spirit, if I'm walking according to the Spirit, what am I going to do? I'm going to um, uh, respond like Christ would respond. And it doesn't mean I naturally just automatically respond like Jesus responds. I've got to choose it. This says, I, there, this I say then, he's talking to Christians, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You've got to choose to walk in the spirit. You don't have to focus on, not, on trying not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You need to focus on walking in the spirit. Stop focusing in on the temptations that you're experiencing. Stop focusing on the negative emotions that are challenging you and overwhelming you. Stop focusing in on the sin that you are struggling with and start focusing in on Jesus. Start focusing in on walking in the Spirit. And as a, or as a, a natural byproduct of walking in the Spirit, you will stop fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. This is really important, and it's super simple. This is the gospel. The gospel changed you, made you a new creation. So now you can walk in in the Spirit, walk according to the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lusts or the desires of the flesh. I want to encourage you to meditate on these things. Think about these things because they will help you to walk in freedom. As Christians, we are free, but we don't automatically walk in freedom. And God's desire for you is that you walk in freedom. Amen. Amen. 